Hi, everyone. Um, welcome. Hi. Um, I'm going to get started just because uh, we have a lot of ground to cover today. And, um, and I want to make sure to give our panelists a lot of time to um, not only have a discussion, but also respond to your questions as well. So um, I'm just going to, first of all, introduce the topic. Um, and myself, my name is Jennifer Nala Milliken. I'm the Artistic Director for the Center for Art in Wood. And we are here today to talk about exploration, experimentation, and collaboration, um, and 25 years of the Wingate International Residency Program of the Center for Art in Wood. Um, let's, I have a bit of visual material to share with you. Um, while I do that, so you um, have some eye candy to take a look at. Um, while I'm blabbing. Um, so um, for those of you who were not able to join us um, on November 6th, when we um, held round one of this session, um, featuring five different um, IT alumni. This is a program um, dedicated to looking back at 25 years of the Wingate International Turning Exchange, commonly known as the ITE. Um, the ITE was founded in uh, 1995, and since then it has become known as a uniquely collaborative arts residency program. It takes two summer months every year. Uh, for this period of time, from the early, um, early weeks of June to um, the first week in August, uh, artists and researchers from around the world will live, work, ideate, and create together in the glamorous center of Philadelphia. Together, they share knowledge and skill, but they also form lasting bonds that extend beyond the residency. During this tumultuous time, breakthroughs, intense bursts of creativity, material, and conceptual experimentations, and collaborations occur. Significantly, this singular place-based experience engages a wide community beyond the participating fellows. From children enjoying the interactive and touchable works in the exhibition that culminates the program, to collectors who seek to expand their art holdings and get to know artists individually and form relationships and bonds on their own. So this conversation, which I mentioned is round two, features past fellows of the residency program and it explores the before, during and after experiences that were sparked by the ITE. It offers a window into the legendary program which is now a sought after destination for artists seeking to deepen their engagement with the material of wood. Of course, in 2020, we, um, it was an auspicious year for the residency. It was the first in which the residency didn't happen in 25 years, but it also offered us an opportunity to look uh, retrospectively at the last quarter century and to celebrate um, that long length of time in an exhibition um, called Alternatives, Form and Spirit, 25 years of the I Wingate ITE residency program. It is now, the exhibition opened in uh, late October and it continues until the end of January. Um, and I should mention now, um, we'll do it again at the end of the program, but I should mention to you that um, next week there'll be two additional events um, associated with the exhibition and you're invited to any and all programming of course um, please keep in touch with the center um, to find out what they are the 23rd which is a saturday who will signal the closing of the exhibition will have a happy hour with a trivia contest um, and um, conversation and um, it should be a, a fun gathering of um, alumni and friends of the residency program over the last 25 years. Um, and there might be some juicy stuff that comes out of that too. I don't know. Uh, you'll have to show up to find out. Uh, so moving on, I want to um, first of all thank the um, Wow, 25 years of the Center for Art and Wood and the residency program, of course, the Wingate Foundation 
uh, which has offered incredible foundational support to make the residency program possible. Um, I also wish to thank the um, staff of the Center for Art and Wood for um, not only cultivating and fostering this program every year and investing the time and expertise that it takes to put on each one of these programs, um, but particularly Karen Schoenwald, who is here with us today, who um, was instrumental in helping the exhibition take shape and has done so much research and work in uncovering the histories and images and materials and things that we didn't know about, it allowed us to tie loose ends and put pieces together um, to further build on the history of the um, residency. So it's been really, really important to be able to do this. Um, so now I'm going to call on each of our panelists to um, briefly introduce themselves and, um, and then you'll get to know them through the course of the conversation. So I'm gonna start with Felicia Francine Dean. Felicia, say hi. Hi everyone, how are you doing? Thank you for coming today. Um, so just a little bit about myself. I'm a 2017 um, Wingate ITE fellow. Uh, currently, I am an assistant professor at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville in the School of um, Interior Architecture. Uh, it's held within the College of Architecture and Design. The work I do focuses on looking in at my biracial background, specifically with the processes that I use and the experimentation that I go through with it. Um, I use mediums such as stone, wood, and textiles and focus on soft and um, soft systems of upholstery and hard systems too. Thank you, Felicia. Um, thanks for joining us tonight too. It's so great to see you and to meet you. Yeah. It's great to see all the faces. <laughs> uh, Morgan Hill. Hi, Morgan. Hi. Um, I was in the residency in 2018. And um, I currently live in Penland, North Carolina. I do work at Penland School of Craft and I have a studio nearby in Spruce Pine. Um, I work uh, in that studio with several of other wood artists and um, kind of dabble in different mediums, mostly using wood, but sort of let my idea always uh, generate what materials I'm using. So that's about it, thanks. thanks. Well, thanks for joining us. Uh, Morgan's work in the exhibition, of course. We'll come back to that. Um, Todd Hoyer. Hi, Todd. Hi. Hi. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm one of the guinea pigs, the 1995 uh, ITE residency. Um, I live in Bisbee, Arizona. I have a, a studio at home. Uh, I continue to work with wood and I'm incorporating metal, um, which was part of one of my majors in college. Uh, so the incorporation of metal and wood creates a nice balance in my work. Thank you, Todd. Thanks Thank for coming all the way from Bisbee. <laughs> <laughs> um, Yuri Kobayashi. Hi, Yuri. Hi, Nata. Thank you for having me. And uh, good evening, everyone. I did participated in that residency in 2014. Feels like many years ago. At the same time, feels like just last year. Um, it feels a little bit weird to know that to see that number 2014 in front of me. Um, I am. I would like to consider myself as a um, furniture maker, sculptor. And then I do also like to do installation, woodworker, just wood as a, my strongest medium to create objects. And then currently I'm in Maine, kind of, I hold a long relationship with Center for Furniture, Center for Furniture Craftsmanship in Maine. And that's, um, where my major studio practice uh, taken place. And here I am, and I'm kind of teaching, started the teaching just this session right now. And I would like to be a full-time maker. Thank you, Yuri. It's good to see you. Um, Haley, also. Uh, hi there. <laughs> Hi, I'm Haley Smith. 
Um, I was born in Wales. I now live in Bisbee, Arizona. I was also one of the guinea pigs on the first ITE residency. I still work with wood. I used a lathe to frame my exploration of material, uh, form, surface. And here I am with Todd, <laughs> who uh, I met on the ITE residency. And uh, we continue to work together, share a studio, and live here mile high in the Mule Mountains. <laughs> Thank you, Ailey. Thanks for coming. Um, and thanks for sharing a window with, with Todd. That means you get half. <laughs> um, and of course, this is Haley's work in the collection. Um, just to, I put a, together a few, um, a few images together, just a little bit of eye candy um, that looks at um, candid shots of each of our panelists today while they're in the residency, um, while they're on ITE. Um, here we have an image of the first cohort ever in 1995 from left to right. We have Richard Hooper, we have Haley, we have Timothy Stokes, Bo Schmidt, Judd Randall, and then there's Todd on the right. Um, and sadly, um, two of these um, members are no longer with us, Bo and Judd. Um, Judd most recently passed away last year. Um, so we're so glad to have the legacy of Vaughn um, with the works that they um, contributed to the center and to our history. Um, out of, we've had something like 100, I think it's 166, if that's right, Karen, um, fellows over 25 years. Um, and uh, that's a pretty amazing collection of people. That would be a great party to have at some point. Um, of course, here we have... Um, Yuri, and I believe that's Jack Laramore, if I'm not wrong. Um, at some point, Yuri, you're going to tell me what you were talking about. Um, and, oh, go ahead. No. Okay. <laughs> um, here we, we have a bird's eye view of Felicia's workspace um, in 2017. And um, of course, the opening night of um, the exhibition in 2018 with Morgan showing some of her work from the show. Um, and of course, that was my first year uh, with the center and with the program as well. So that's um, always going to be a very special cohort for me. Uh, and, and then here's an image of the, um, the current installation of the, um, the exhibition. And um, I just want to point out the here, um, if you can see my arrow, on the right on this wall, there is a timeline. And this timeline is um, also available for you to play with in the, um, on the Woodshed uh, website. And when I say play, I am serious. You can interact with the timeline. You can add your own material to the timeline. You can add your words and experiences and notes. Um, you can make corrections. God forbid if something's not right. Um, and um, you can, you can whatever you want in there. Hopefully it's, um, it's appropriate. Uh, but we would, we would love to have you interact with that. And of course, that's going to continue in perpetuity beyond the closing of the exhibition. But I do invite you all to um, interact with it. And, um, and then for those of you who are here, also to, um, to check in and view it as it grows as a living document. Um, okay, I'm going to stop sharing now. And um, launch right into the conversation. So the first question I'm going to throw out is um, a really general one. Um, and um, it's really focused on the general role that arts residents play in the careers of artists and researchers. Based on your experience, how important are these experiences for, for artists and their work? Oh, I'll jump right in. Um, for me, uh, residencies have been absolutely formative in my work. Uh, they've afforded me the opportunity to uh, focus on what I'm doing by being removed from the day to day. Um, it's also because I've always been a full-time maker since leaving college, 
it's also um, given me the means to support myself while I've been able to actually experiment with my work. And especially if you're younger, I think for me at the beginning of my career, it really allowed me to interact with people that I may not have otherwise. So an incredibly important role in the development of my work. Thank you. I would say for myself, the experimentation portion of it, um, being able to push that and do that, um, you know, with the, with the um, Wingate ITE, it was always interesting because Albert, would, he would have it to where, you know, think about just, you know, the process and experimenting right now, not the, you know, the final thing, don't worry about it. But at some point you have to say like, I have to get this stuff done, right? I have to have something in this exhibit. Um, but at the same time, it really allowed you to just kind of not, kind of think about the other noise, right? And be able to experiment, be able to, you know, challenge yourself in new ways um, and also learning from others. Um, and like was mentioned, the opportunities are huge um, with who you meet and what you learn from the others around you um, while you're there, whether it's in the studio or whether it's just over a drink. Uh, I, wanna, I wanna ask one question based on what you said, Felicia, about, about feeling the pressure um, of having to show something for the exhibition. Was that a motivating factor during the nine, eight or nine short weeks on the residency or? Um, um, I it... would say what was motivating were the people around me, honestly, the energy that was there. And it was like, we could still do more is how I felt like our team was. Um, that, I mean, we were, and Karen will tell you, <laughs> when are you getting your stuff in, when are you bringing it in, right? You got to get it here. She'll, you, she'll tell you, like, we were um, trying to get, you know, in the end, the most we could, but we did so much experimenting in the beginning at the same time um, that it didn't hinder us at all. I think, if anything, I know for myself, it allowed me to look back on things that I thought were maybe mistakes that I put to the side and revisit those and revisit those in a way that allowed me to kind of break free from um, being so uh, um, kind of specific about what it needs to be or what it needs to look like, but rather what this can be and what I can make and have this um, object that's something new. Um, and just, you know, with a time limitation, it allowed me to say, okay, let's just see what happens. I have work to go in, but if there's something more I can do, um, that's great too. Yeah, thanks. Something you said reminded me of a quote that uh, was uncovered in the course of researching for the exhibition. And that was um, Yuri, I think I, I'm really quoting it, but you said uh, two, days, two days left, but so much more fun left to have. I do remember that. But I was so like, we, we had the beginning like it being fun and felt like so much time left. And then I felt it like all, all of us in the team that felt like, Okay, three weeks left. It, it kind of like a mm, kind of tension level or like a focus level. It kind of shifted. What are we gonna do? Like a two weeks left, one week left, and but at the same time, like our, our board did not give us a pleasure. It did not complete. Complete is not the goal. Like a completion of the project is not goal. And then if you are okay agree then you can include even uncompleted piece that's fine so that kind of like gives us like kind of reduce the level of stress and okay um just have fun that was the kind of spirit that threw out the um residency program so i had a fun and um i think the show was having a show in the end was good it sets us Yes, sometimes some type of pleasure and the goal. And um, it was good for me, like bringing back to um, what was good about the this residency. For me was that it was nice to have the peers around so that it, it was kind of spontaneous. Like, what do you think? Like, like it's something that I would not be able to do in a, outside of the studio setting like, this residency that I don't have always have peers. I have students around, but I'm students is not the sometimes appropriate to ask their opinion for my personal project. 
but just having like a peers and what do you think? And they're just like pitching in. So it's not like a collaboration that actually see as a uh, end result, but during that um, kind of process, the collaboration is actually happening in a day-to-day -day kind of basis. That part I really appreciated and enjoyed. Oh, thank you. I think that really sums up quite beautifully it's the unique character of collaboration as it takes shape um, on the residency. And I think I want to come back to that later in the discussion, but I think that's a really important part of the character of it. Um, before I move on, Morgan or Todd, did you have um, something to mention during this first question? Well, there, there were a lot of challenges. You know, anytime you go to a different location, um, you have different tools, you have different machines. Uh, so there's a lot of focus in on um, trying to figure out how to do what you want with the materials you have. Um, in your studios, you can get a piece of wood that you know you have. When you go to a residency, you have to sit, you know, use what they have there. So a lot of challenges, a um, lot of inspiration just due to being outside of your own space in a different environment. Um, it allows you to really open your eyes and be aware constantly. Absolutely. Um, I will just add that I, I don't have any other experiences with uh, residencies like this one. Um, so I just have a super high standard at this point of what a residency should be because this one was just everything and more that I could imagine. So um, yeah. Well, I mean, you would, I view you, Morgan, as, as an expert in the field, being that you live in a residency environment. For yeah, there's always, um, I've been in programs where something is, I've had a work requirement or, um, you know, there hasn't been the total freedom that I experienced at, at your residency. So um, that made all the difference for me to really make work that was important to me without sort of pressure, for sure. Thank you, yeah, definitely. So that leads me to the next uh, question, which is um, what's touched on a little bit, especially in discussions of uh, mentions of the opportunity to explore, but Albert, who is right here, um, set the guiding goals for the residency as exploration, um, experimentation, and collaboration. Um, and this, the residency was unique designed to bring together fellows operating in designated roles through the fellowships that are um, designed for them, uh, principally artist fellows, scholar fellows, and photojournalist, um, or as we're calling it now, visual documentarian uh, fellowships. And these roles encourage interaction um, and, of course, documentation and discourse. Um, in your views and in your experience of IPE, how did these parts fit together to create the unique experience that you encounter? Well, because we were the first, you know, we had no blueprint. So Judd was the photographer and the journalist. Um, we remember one of the first few days we all got together in the garage, set up a slide projector and started projecting our work on the wall just to show, you know, each of us what we did. And then Judd would ask questions, you know, um, why did you do that? What does this mean? I, I think when you're working in your own studio, your ideas are internalized, but actually being questioned actually having to verbalize um, you know, your ideas, it really helps clarify and just the opportunity to actually kind of interact you know, with someone who was always you know, kind of asking questions, literally documenting the process, you know, just, just taking everything that you had inside and actually putting it out into the world it was just an amazing opportunity to actually clarify 
you know, both our work and then what other people were doing too. I, I mean, I, perhaps you noticed as I was flipping through the images that were taken by photojournalists over the years. Um, and as I was putting this together, I realized how critically important that role is um, on the residency because without that, that fellow, we wouldn't have the wealth of material that we have to kind of piece these stories back together um, 25 years after they happened. And that's so critically important. Um, as a historian myself, I, I value that um, dearly, but, but to just have it at our fingertips was incredibly important. Um, I think one of the ways in which um, the overlap happens also is um, you, you get to see how people see your work through their lens itself. Yeah. And um, I think that's one of the biggest things to experience. You know, it's not, you know, working in a silo at all, right? It's, it's really like um, mentioned previously about questions being asked of you. Um, and then at the same time, it, we're able to see others approaches and think about our own approach to work. Um, and understand our work itself by understanding the ways in which others approach their own. So it's just kind of back and forth exchange that we're able to get, whether it's verbally or just through, you know, maybe taking a break and, you know, watching your, your, your peers um, do their thing and, and work in the way and the methods in which they do. Um, and then there's these overlaps, right, that happen in conversations about approaches. I remember with Max Brosi, um, we were in the dorm, right, at, um, at the university and he was talking about ebonizers. And I was like, do you mean modifiers, like in textiles? And he's like, yeah, ebonizers. And I was like, wait, take a look. And I had this jar of a modifier, ebonizer. And so we started, you know, messing with it in the in the actual dormitory, you know, experimenting on woods and him showing me what he knows about the ebonizers, me talking about it with regards to textiles. And just this idea of media and approach um, and seeing it through his lens and then him seeing it through mine, I think was just real, really valuable. Uh, one thing I'd like to say is um, what I discovered on the ITE by actually working with Todd, collaborating with him, that a lot of times we thought we were talking about the same thing and we would often find, like you're saying, we were talking about completely different things and it took a long time when we started to collaborate to actually create a language that we could both understand. Uh, that was kind of a completely eye-opening experience. And then has that, I, I just have to ask because um, you are both partners in, well, you're partners in life, um, but you also um, continue your separate practices. Do those conversations yes. continue uh, very much kind of in the same tone? Yes, we, we did a, uh, a group of collaborative work after ITE. Um, we worked, you know, overseas through the facts. You know, that was when there were faxes <laughs> still. And uh, we shared ideas. Haley would come out to Bisbee. We would do some work and then she'd have to go back. But eventually we got a, a group of collaborative pieces that together and had an exhibition in Scottsdale. It was probably three years later. So, you know, we carried on the collaboration, which was, you know, part of the ITE original um, goal and, yeah. Uh, and also we did another residency. Um, it, we were in Australia in 2002 and we kind of revisited working together and we produced a collaborative body of work then. Uh, by that stage, you know, we'd been working together on and off for about seven years. And it really was a work in progress, um, just kind of refining both a visual and a verbal language that we both could understand. And did that have impact in your work to the present day, um, whether through threads of concept or approach? Well, sharing our ideas and talking about, you know, what we're doing individually. Yeah, we understand each other much better that way. 
so yes, I mean, I guess even when we're working on our own work, we still talk to each other about it. Um, but, you know, it's been a very well, 25 year process. So the language now is easier to understand. But in the beginning, it was really a struggle to even find a common language because we, we would think we were talking about the same thing and discovered we weren't. Fantastic. Um, we, we can pick up the thread. I think, I think this also connects to, as Haley and Todd mentioned, um, the, the practice of collaboration forms that comes from you know, being in this kind of immersive environment where you're 24 seven surrounded by, um, throughout the course of the residency, at least six other fellows. And then at one point, um, another one adds to the mix, maybe even changes the dynamic a little bit. Uh, could you talk about that? Your experiences of that? I mean, I know um, for us, it took a while to collaborate because it we really kind of needed to see people like and how they worked, um, you know, to see how the collaboration might work. So um, obviously we were building relationships, but we were also trying to understand, I think individually, what collaborations could look like. Um, because really the, the dynamic between someone is huge when you're collaborating, right? So understanding like where those dynamics lie and what they might look like. Um, and like I said, kind of the energy that's given off. Um, so collaborations could have happened just through critiques, right? Um, where you're taking a break and you're saying, you know, hey, Jason, like, you know, can you give me some advice on this when you get a second or um, the same? And I know for myself, seeing what other people were doing to understand how a collaboration could be formed was one thing. So the collaboration that I had worked on um, with the piece, say, with Max Bursey, that happened kind of later on down the line because we were really understanding each other's approaches, um, kind of the ways in which we worked and how thus ultimately we could see each other working together. And Jason is here. Yes. <laughs> um, and we still collab, we still stay in touch. So like there's things that might come up where I know recently I asked Jason if he could um, you know, speak to another professor um, that I work with about cardboard. Um, so there's still things that happen, even though it may not be physical collaboration, there's still that networking and collaboration that we still reach out to one another um, in order to uh, make sure you know that um, we, we uh, are keeping in touch in other ways too and collaborating. That is so um, critical in this field and something that I think is, is unique about um, artists who work in wood, uh, whether they be artists or makers or designers, it's a, there isn't this element, deeper element of collaboration. Um, um, and um, and that, might come, that might occur for a number of reasons and we can parse that out maybe in another discussion, but um, there's a lot to unpack there. I know. Um, but Morgan, I wanted to ask you about this question specifically because um, 2018 was a year in which um, there was no, um, let's say, obvious uh, evidence of collaboration, meaning that in, in 2018, there wasn't this like group artwork that remained uh, behind that had the hands of all of the participants involved. On the other hand, socially, um, your, your cohort really was very closely knit together. Yeah, I would say that our group um, collaborated very abstractly and that that didn't turn out to be a physical thing that you could see at the end for, for sure. Um, there were these obvious roles that y'all had put in place for us that, you know, to sort of show how we were all different. And um, I think there was much more genius curation of a group behind there that we still don't know how you put us all together so perfectly. but. Um, yeah, we found that our roles were much, we had so many other roles as a group and ended up fulfilling these other things that we didn't realize we needed. And um, I, I, I'm i not gonna speak for everybody and what their roles were, but you know, I ended up being sort of 
had a social role to like help keep the group like doing things that were fun and that was a huge part of our mm -hmm. experience and I think that um we ended up seeing too that we had um we were collaborating in a way that we were like inspired by opposition so a lot of us were seeing and talking about things and sort of doing the opposite of what the other person was doing and I think that we were fueling that somehow like um and specifically Jack Motch was in the studio the room with me so him and I were so different in what we were working on and worked really differently he was really detailed about what he was doing and I'm over here like flailing you know drawing all over the wall and stuff and I I, I would have a thought and not be able to express it and he was able to give me some words for what I was thinking and at the same time he was able to like start moving his pieces around like he wasn't before you know maybe so I think that that our response was a little more um to to not start doing maybe the same thing and coming together but sort of pushing pushing apart if that makes sense and that that seemed important for us to like find our differences and be proud of them does that make sense absolutely Yuri I do understand that part too and then also like our group did not plan particularly um as a group or as a two individual let's do collaboration or let's make the best if we did not plan it just um happened um by just a daily kind of activity oh how about this like just like checking out like what other people are doing and oh this is interesting oh this is cool and then just like yeah there are bits and the bits just like giving up sharing up, um ideas exchanging ideas and oh do you want to do this together should we do this together it kind of happened that was kind of fun effect and then also sometimes Hmm, what we can do is this and something that um, we did normally I don't do like a carving or shaping as a sculpted um, wooden piece but it just simultaneously happened I carved something and it passed on to Reed and he continued to carving and then coming back and then, oh let's start doing this drawing it's just like having like a kind of daily exchange and like okay this is the day we need to call it done. We need to bring it in. And so I think it was fun for me, not like have specific plan or not aiming a specific goal. I enjoyed more like a sharing part. And then I think what Morgan was saying that too, that more um, collaboration happens not as a physical um project physical like item or uh, outcome but more like a daily like happening like collaboration of the sharing that part i really enjoyed and then it was most while and a totally different experience than any other residency that i have done um yeah yeah that that's so important the spontaneity that comes from proximity mm -hmm. um, but hopefully through an intimacy and a level of um, and trust that comes from being surrounded by the same people every day. Mm -hmm. um, and I, back to Morgan's point about being the cruise director for 2018, karaoke in Philadelphia will never be the same. Karaoke <laughs> is a really important part of a residency in my mind now. It's just <laughs> it has been established, yes. Um, I did want to, I wanted to pop another question on you that, um, that um, I didn't prepare the panelists for this question, but it seems like an important one um, because there's another factor of the IPE that um, is pretty unique and that is the visitation that happens, um, that takes you outside the studio. So for example, um, fellows visit local museums, including the Wharton Esherick Museum, they visit studios of um, local artists such as Mark Sferi. Um, and then they also visit the homes of um, collectors in the field. 
um, throughout the tri-state area. Um, originally, before he moved, this included David Ellsworth, um, but it also includes Judy Chernoff and Jeffrey Bernstein, and Judy's here with us today. Um, Suzanne Kahn, I think I saw her. Um, I just, um, and, um, and then a number of other really, really prominent um, collectors in the field who really support um, and, and cultivate and nurture um, the, um, the field of uh, sculpture and um, art and design in, in the material of wood. And they help lead those conversations. And um, so the relationships that are formed through the residency and the conversations that emerge um, between um, the visitations or the open studio day or other opportunities um, are an important factor of IT. I felt like a roller coaster ride, particularly my ear had the packed schedule in the beginning. And, and then participating to Echo Lake, other collaborations with bigger group, and then coming back. And it, it was just a little bit frustration that you visit something, get excited, stimulated, and looking at. Um, museum and then other objects or like collectors collections and then coming back in a few days and then going somewhere and then it kind of lost just a little bit of like momentum that when you started working on and oh we need to visit this and then get excited and then going back to so that was kind of i say like roller coaster ride like every day was like this um but um it was great experience to visit the museum with again like a peers like not just by myself but also like a we can exchange like oh this is cool and that kind of reflects to coming back to the studio and then we can kind of like a talk about it not discussion but we can talk about it and as a group and um yeah in none of like a residency has this opportunity to visit something as a group together and then seeing exposed to some other uh, type of art of work and then coming back as a group and then talk again. And that reflects to the, what we do at the same time. Um, just, mm, well, I would like to just say that it's really roller coaster, but a unique exciting experiment <laughs> experience sorry yeah. it felt like an experiment at times right <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yeah. we had we, ours was jam-packed in the beginning too um but you know I, I think everyone came in with at least ideas and some people came with more specifics of what they wanted to complete while they were there um in many ways i'm glad i wasn't too specific because of all those experiences uh, it allowed me to not have to feel like obligated to um, stick with that idea and be influenced by all the uh, all the interactions we had with collectors. And I'd say for, for myself, um, one thing for me that it, it really it really reiterated to me and it reinformed me of is the value of the object. And I had that lost for a while, I feel like, because I'd been like an art student in my undergrad. And then I'm just like, how do I live as an art? person who does art, like, how am I going to survive, you know, for someone who like, you know, is trying to already finish college and is a first generation, right? So it was really difficult for me to like, understand that value. Um, and more of my work went towards furniture, because of the function of it. And I could see I could really understand that value, and still be creative with it. But really what the residency did for me, is it brought me back to this idea of the value of the object by seeing collectors and going to these museums and understanding the value of it. And also the value that, that is placed on it by society um, with different groups. So it was a really like mind blowing, really eye opening experience for me in that sense, because it, it, it reiterated um, kind of my original intent going in as a youth in my exploration that this is still possible. Oh, that's incredible. What an observation, the value of the object. Um, and, and that doesn't always have to intersect with function. Exactly, or monetary even, right? It really is of the holder um, and that's placed on it. Um, 
yeah, it just it, it was it was after going through this to, to the collections and hearing um, just the stories about even pieces that um, the collectors had. It really was an experience to understand how they um, valued the particular pieces they had and why. Mm, fantastic. And even in the end, when I finished my, my, my I think my last my, one of my the pieces that um, I had at the uh, the final exhibition, the one that got the most um, like feedback was the one that you know had the, the best story, like it had the story that really told it right. So that value was in that story. Oh, that is that's um that's a meeting on in and of itself. Um, I'm going to be calling you to talk further. About that. <laughs> we could write books about that. Um, I, I did want to ask Judy to say a couple of words. Um, I, I didn't prepare you for this, and you can say no if you want, but being that you're here, I just love to hear um, um, a little bit about your experience of, of the residency from the point of view of someone who is a host um, and very deeply part of ITE um, and someone who I've, you know, benefited from working closely with in the last year um, or last two years, I guess, um, on the program. Well, <laughs> this is a surprise. No pressure. <laughs> uh, no pressure. I, we've been hosting the ITE group for many, many years. Um, and as you all are talking, it's just bringing back a lot of memories of uh, how much we uh, learned and how much we enjoy sharing, you know, the, our collection with people who are really excited about uh, seeing um, seeing how some people collect. Um, I whenever the residents would come here, we would like to feed them so that they would stay a while and engage in conversation. And we got, we really got to know them as people. And then when we came to the center for the exhibitions, um, it was really interesting to learn their and see their artwork after really getting to know them personally in our home. Um, I think it's so valuable for all the reasons you've already mentioned, all of you have already mentioned, but for collectors, I think it's also really valuable for us to see uh, the breadth of what's going on. Um, I think the residents are chosen so carefully to um, bring very different viewpoints to the, to the uh, program. And I just find that very refreshing and also I learn a lot just from that. And I also feel like there's so much to see here in Washington. Um, and I know what Yuri said, it's like you all are so packed with what you have to be doing there, but it's such a great opportunity if you're gonna sort of be in this area that that we can open our homes to you and you can you know, have the kind of experience that Felicia just said when she, you know, reacquainted herself with a love of objects, so. Well, thank you, Judy. Thanks for being here today. Um, I, I have, let's see, I have two questions um, and then I wanna open it up to all of you. So um, if you have questions, please feel free to write them down in the chat and we'll be sure to bring them into the conversation. Um, so question, um, to me, it's a really important question. Um, and it's about the residency and its impact on the wider field. Um, did the residency complicate or intensify your understanding of wood as a material that inspires creativity? Um, and, and do you think it has bearing on, on the wider field of art and wood? Well, for myself, um, I teach about wood, wood characteristics, and uh, how they relate to turned objects. So I had an understanding of the material. What I discovered at the residency was ash. We don't get much ash in Arizona. And ash is a great uh, ring porous wood, which allowed me to really 
play with sandblasting and scorching and accentuating uh, uh, the grain. So I incorporated a lot more of that in the pieces I did during the ITE. Uh, I would like to talk about the importance I think that the residency had in terms um, for me as a material. My background, when I was actually in school, I was actually majoring in printmaking. And it was accidental that I started uh, working with wood uh, during the second year of my program. I went into the library and there was a book on the shelf, uh, the George Nakashima book, Soul of the Tree. And that gave me such a reverence for the material. But because my program was idea-based and not material-based, I really struggled with working with the material. So um, in 1995, one of the things I requested was that we could possibly go to the studio of George Nakashima, which was an incredible experience. I mean, kind of, you know, <laughs> very spiritual, you know, going there with a group of people. But during the ITE, I really started to learn um, how to balance the material and what I wanted to do with it. And a lot of the other residents who had a lot more experience with the material helped me understand it from a technical point of view. And so for me, the ITE was kind of like a real starting point, my personal kind of journey, um, kind of like, you know, a marriage between ideas and material. So for me, it, it, was, it was kind of an incredible experience. Mm -hmm. I would like to add to that, not necessarily probably like medium as, I mean, a word as a medium, but I also find out that everybody has different training to get to, to make their project, I mean, an object. And I have Japanese, traditional Japanese training, and someone brings from Ghana that has really focused on hand tool and really limited machine access to fabricate his, he was well known for making a coffin. And so like in the end, like I was kind of focusing and my work is always detail oriented. It's crisp clean, that's always like my goal. And he does this like using like a hand tool and it's not like, loose but I kind of open up my uh, goal to be this is not the always like the preciseness is not always a kind of answer there is a way to do the work in, in a different way or a different um, approach is I kind of started accepting that or like allowing myself to do it so that's kind of like a reflecting to my when I approach to sculpture and when I make fine furniture or commission and when I do installation. So there is a kind of uh, range from the um, preciseness or approach to the woodworking, does that make sense? Um, that's, that was kind of valuable experience or ex um, closure to variety, like wide range of uh, woodworking. Mm -hmm. For myself, um, working with wood, uh, you know, it really opened me up to understanding about kind of growth and regrowth and transformation. Um, coming out of this residency, I focused a lot on materials and experimentation. Um, the technical part was something, you know, that I felt was always secondary. That's something you can learn, right? But to really understand the material and look at it in new ways and understand its composition through the hand was something I'd always really enjoyed. Um, and I, I realized after the, the, um, the residency, I started questioning why that was my approach. Um, and the residency really gave me the ability to first foresee or see through a project that really talked about material identity through wood and textiles and the nature of those and how they can come together and be similar um, and have similar identities, um, but at the same time be you know almost part of a family. 
And I hadn't really thought about why I did certain things the way I did until ITE. Um, and it really got me understanding that, you know, the way in which I grew up as a biracial individual is that I needed to find my place. I needed to experiment. I needed to move. I needed to understand it more. So through materials, it's allowed me to, with wood specifically at this residency, to kind of understand how I approach it as into understanding why. And that was huge. Like, that was huge for me um, when I began to realize beyond just kind of doing, but asking why, right? We do what we do. Um, so that way, that's the way ma the material has really changed my outlook um, on life and experiences. And Felicia, you correct me if I'm wrong, but you came to the residency not necessarily focused on wood, but rather, um, Wood was part of the process. I, I worked in a lot of multimedia and um, the, some of the work that I, I showed was yes, in metals um, with upholstered like um, three-dimensional upholstered systems as part of that. A lot of sewing, I have an upholstery background, but one of the works I began focusing on before ITE was this idea of hat making and how um, hat blocks uh, um, are used to create um, kind of, you know, a small batch production of items that can be replicated. Um, and then that moved into even after the residency, understanding the, the wear and tear on the body of the maker, right? Um, and thinking about that during the residency, right? <laughs> we, we all had some wear and tear. Um, and, and, you know, the, the forms in which I have, which I don't think you have an image of it, but, you know, I was blocking, you know, forms off of these hat blocks. And so that still is in my research today, um, but, I was understanding again, kind of this identity being transformed from that wood form into pulling off a, a felt form to, and then to see maybe the difference in the, in the two on um, themselves. Anyone else before I um, launch into the, into the last question? Um, and I, and I do want to mention that there are um, other alumni here with us um, tonight. I see Katie Hutnall. Uh, we did introduce, Katie, uh, we introduced Jason Schneider, who's here, um, Suju, um, here. And, um, and so I feel it's really important to ask this question. Um, as alumni of, of the um, Wingate ITE residency, what do you, what is your advice for um, the uh, fellows in 2021? When they, when they show up in June, what can you tell them to help their experience? Don't expect anything specific, just to come with a free, have fun. I agree yeah. with you. Come with a Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Roller coaster ride that Yuri talks about. If you can just get on it and just let that happen, there are so many things that are given to you that if you are looking to just go in a room and start making something, that maybe you need something else. And if you're open to that, there are so many other things being offered. Right. I was just going to say, come with ideas, but expect changes. I'll never forget um, Jack uh, Vouch, who was on in the 2018 cohort. He told me that he showed up with um, a very prescribed kind of idea of what he was going to be doing. And then he ended up in the center of Philadelphia with the heat and the noise um, and everything going on and all of the activity. He had to learn how to abandon that and, and um, kind of embrace the conditions that he was under. They changed the, the uh, body of work that he was creating and working on. And, and that kind of versatility and read, being ready for anything um, has really stuck with me um, in, the, in the ensuing two years of experiencing a um, unique program from my perspective. Yeah, I would agree. Just have fun. Definitely. Yeah. Um, Felicia had the. Go ahead, Felicia. No, go ahead. <laughs> no, I wish I had a little bit more time to explore Philadelphia. I was kind of sleep, studio, sleep, studio. I wish I had 
saved a little bit more time to explore Philadelphia too. That um, it's a great city to be in. Sorry. <laughs> Absolutely. And it's not, you know, since since it's um, since it was moved into the center of Philadelphia. So this is something that Haley and Todd did not experience, but but. Um, since it has, and I think it's the last 15 years it's been in the center of Philadelphia, that um, it has taken on this di very different character from most um, residencies in North America, which take place in these, you know, bucolic um, settings that are removed from the urban life and noise uh, and cacophony um, that we normally, some of us are surrounded, not, not the folks in Bisbee, but some of us are surrounded by <laughs> Um, and uh, and that's another kind of that setting is um, is a really unique aspect. And it could either frustrate or feed um, the work that you do on site. Any other advice before I throw it out to the? I would just say also just you know take the time to understand your peers. Um, you know the dynamic is always going to be very different. The group I had we had a fantastic dynamic. I mean I think ultimately we. We just tried to understand each other more and more. And as we began to do that, um, it got, you know, kind of easier with personalities um, and understanding personalities. So I would just, I would just say go in with an open mind and also like, uh, you know, under, to understand other people too um, as you're working and as you're, uh, you know, in, in, like experiencing these things together, right? Mm, thank you. Yeah. I want to add that there was a really report important relationship that we don't realize that we're gaining with the center and that has continued i mean it's con obviously continued for all of us that we have a relationship with the center and people connected to the center so donors collectors um people that come in to the center all the time get to buy my jewelry and um that relationship is so huge and uh that i get to be a part of a family that you know, has lasted even this long and continues is so awesome. Thank you. That's awesome. That's That's true. Great. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're really, really thrilled that you're a part of our family. And that you're here today with us. Um, so I want to thank everybody here. Um, and I want, let's see, I have a question from Martin Saban Smith. Um, when you are planning a new body of work, where do you look for inspiration? Or does the inspiration come to you when you least expect it? Um, I look for, I mean, I, for me, the hardest thing is understanding what the form will be um, and where you generate form and where form comes from. And I, you know, I, I always think of it as what's going to keep me the most interested you know, um, what am I really going to get into and, and want to be, you know, looking at and staring at for hours on end and working, you know. Um, so that, that's kind of the way I, I approach that aspect of it. But at the same time, there's a lot of reflection in that process to where, again, you're not um, necessarily bound to whatever sketches of form you might have looked at previously, but rather you're allowing kind of this ebb and flow to happen and for changes to occur based on um, the process, right, and the experimentation and the process of the of the work itself. Mm. Great. Anyone else? A lot of my work is kind of a stepping stone from the previous to the next piece, so that uh, it's just uh, kind of a, a continuation of ideas, perspectives, and uh, of course, environment makes a, a huge uh, difference. If I'm at home, there's pretty much a smooth flow. But when Haley and I did a residency in Australia, we started from scratch. We dropped everything we knew in terms of form and direction and started with the inspiration of Australia itself to create a, a new body of work. I was, I was sitting here thinking exactly the same thing. I've never actually sat down and really planned for a, a new body of work, um, a new direction. They've just happened spontaneously, other than when Todd and I have actually collaborated. And, you know, Australia was probably kind of um, the only experience where it was completely kind of encapsulated 
because it was in a completely different environment uh, with new inspiration. So we went out and explored that environment, um, found what was of mutual interest, and then we started sitting down, drawing and planning. But I think that is the only occasion where I can say that I've actively planned a new body of work. Yeah, that's a very different process. And I assume you had a kind of um, time frame that allowed you to work in that way. Yes, we it was it was two months. We had a it was two months, wasn't it? Yes, two months. Two months, which is you know a long time. Um, we had two weeks initially to go out and explore the environment, and then was it six weeks in the studio? Five or, six, yeah. Five or six weeks in a studio, but it was just the two of us working together. So we were very much able to focus on that body of work. Uh, we also taught some workshops while we were there, but um, very much focused on that body of work. Um, we have a question from Dave Weider. Uh, and um, He's asking if it's important to bring work that's already in progress to the residency. Um, so are, are any of you, in, were any of you in that situation where you brought work that was already kind of um, underway uh, for continued exploration or completion maybe even um, during IT? I did. I did mm -hmm. I too. I, but in the end, I did not show that piece. And then mm -hmm. I, did bring and then I worked when I got stuck because I know they already like a, what to do and I brought it and then I played with it a little bit but in the end I did not work at all <laughs> and I did not include in that show either. Yeah I did I actually um I brought the ideas with me to foresee one of the projects through um I honestly uh, wasn't sure if that was gonna be the case uh I just kind of had it on my plate right if it's there mm -hmm. it's available if it works if it ha happens to happen um but it's, it was some work I had done on a, um on some research at a millinery class actually at Finland um that I had been at uh as a graduate student at that time and um I continued that work um when I was at the residency um with ITE and was able to foresee that through. But it wasn't something I necessarily knew that I was going to do. It just kind of, I came with my sketchbooks, you know, and I came with some wood if I needed it. And that was really it. To have something in your pocket. Yeah, exactly. Well, you also brought your shop bot. Oh, yeah. My car was... <laughs> My car, I have to say, my car was loaded up. Don't get me wrong, because I didn't know what to expect. I did bring a lot of materials. Um, and yeah, ShopBot, they allowed me to bring one of their small ShopBots. They sponsored me, which, um, you know, I just happened to ask and they let me bring a small ShopBot. And I figured I was going to be turning, honestly, blocks while I was there um, the main, the, during the main time. But we were a group that was at um, NextFab in addition to UART. So it was a little different. Um, and the resources were a little bit different. And so I found myself um, going more towards the CNC um, and some with some turning also, but then also, um, you know, hand carving in addition to that uh, because of kind of how I was assessing where the work was going for me um, at the time. So yeah, I, I really did come prepared and I'm glad I did because honestly, I, I'm, I'm not sure. I think I would have been a little bit more lost with kind of where I needed to be or what I would be using um, because of NextFab, you know, the, the, the tools that they had to be able to share at the time. Um, but, you know, that was something that was unusual about my year. I'll agree with Felicia in that I, I appreciated that I came having done all of the work that you would do before you would put your hands on the piece. I had planned for a few months before on, you know, my ideas and design and, you know, what are the tools that I might need that might not be there? All of those things I had done so I could just get started right um, when we got there. And I think that I would have been spending quite a lot of time figuring out what materials, if I had not done all that before I came. So I thought that worked out. 
Yeah. Yeah, good question. Um, Suju had a question. Um, did you work on one piece at a time during the residency or did you work on multiple pieces at once? Multiple, multiple pieces at once. And yeah, my project going and piece with someone, piece with someone going. So like multiple pieces all at once. It was, and for me, it was, it's harder because I never worked that way in my work uh, studio practice. So that was hard, but it was going back and forth. I do this a little bit and then collaborate piece and it, I did multiple pieces all together. And one piece that I did not complete, that I did not include um, in the show, but I was quite happy with what we got. Yuri, I need to know, did you ever finish or resolve that piece that did end up in the show? Will you, tell, will you ask me again? Did you did you ever end up resolving that one piece that didn't end up in the exhibition? I have it in, in a storage place and, <laughs> and I'm completed. I should revisit, but um, it's really difficult to revisit, to go back to the momentum and uh, passion about the piece. Um, so I should revisit, revisit sometime soon. Um, yeah. Let me know if that happens. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I also worked on multiple pieces. I mean, that was the challenge because I'm used to just working on one piece at a time, but due to the short period in the studio and the exhibition at the end, you know, you'd work on one piece and then get to a point where it would need to sit for a day or two. So you go on to another piece and yeah, it kept me very busy. Uh, Awia had four, was it four or four and a half weeks in the studio, so things were, were pretty condensed. Yeah, I also worked on multiple pieces at once. Um, and I, I think I think what allowed for that too is the scale. I usually work at a larger scale um, when and that you know means that I'm probably focusing on one piece normally. Um, though there might be ideation and, and things, experimentation, mock-ups, things that happen in between, right? That could go towards any piece. So maybe that work on the, the front end is really about all the pieces ultimately, right? Um, but really what the, it ends up focusing on a lot of times for me is one piece, but the scale I was able to work with um, at ITE um, allow, allowed me and afforded me to do multiple pieces at once. I did multiple pieces at once too. Um, and I ended up having several different studio spaces. So I think that's what, how, you know, having a space where I was sleeping, having a space in the school's kind of metals area and in the wood shop area. So um, I just had stuff laid out everywhere. <laughs> uh, absolutely. And Morgan, you were torching things um, at once. Uh, yeah, everybody was so accommodating at that school to let me just go in other studios and do what I needed to do. That's great. Well, I, I just want to thank everybody for sticking around for a few extra minutes and, um, and for being here uh, this evening. I've learned so much about the program that I didn't know. Um, I didn't ever think that I knew everything there was to know about ITE. Um, the only one who even comes close to that is Albert, of course. Um, and, um, and I'm so grateful for everything that Albert has, um, has uh, started and built and nurtured and cultivated over the years. And um, this very, very unique and singular residency program is just one of those things that, um, that is such an anchor to um, the mission and, um, and also the future of the Center for Art and Wood. And um, we talked about family and certainly all of you are part of our family and we're so grateful and um, thrilled and honored to, to include you and to know you. Um, 
please stick around with us um, next year, uh, next year. Um, I think we've just entered into the new year. Um, next week, um, Saturday, um, same time, I think, right, Katie? Um, same time, same place. We're going to be here for the um, closing ITE happy hour. Um, it's 6 p.m. It's a half hour earlier. Earlier. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, two days before that, on um, Wednesday evening, we are going to be regaled by the one and only Gord Federin. Um, and, um, and for those of you who will be joining us on Saturday, there may be one or two trivia questions based on Gord's talk that might push you ahead during the trivia contest. Just, just throwing that out there. Um, and of course, Gord himself is a singular experience and a phenomenon. So um, none of us want to miss that at all. Um, thank you so much. I want to thank again the staff of the Center for Art and Wood, um, Karen, Katie, Sarah, um, who's created so much of the interactive um, virtual offerings um, that you can experience in the woodshed, um, Fred, Lori, Sam, um, I think, I think, I hope I'm not missing anyone, Albert and Tina, um, and um, um, Tara, um, the, the ITE shop supervisor um, for many, many years, um, and everybody who's been a part of this program for so many years. It is amazing to be able to um, know you and to work with you and to continue putting Joe Seltzer, who is here, one of the chairs of um, Echo Lake, Echo Lake uh, Conference. Um, I, I'm just learning so much every day just being around you. So um, thank you so much. And please be in touch. And um, hope to see you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Bye. everyone. Thank you. Uh, thank Bye. you. Bye. <laughs> Have a great night. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks.